he had some comments about Michael Jordan that he wished he didn't play in his shadow at the peak of his career. Let me read these to you. He said, honestly, I wish I never played in Washington, and for a number of reasons, things were still being run through Michael Jordan. Head coach Doug Collins, I love Doug, but I think that was an opportunity for him to make up for some ill moments that they may have had back in Chicago. It just kind of spiraled in a way that I didn't enjoy that season at all. The kind of picture I had in my mind of Michael Jordan and the reverence I had for him, I lost a little bit of it during the course of that year. Jay, you're up first. How does Stackhouse's comments make Jordan look? Uh, I mean, look, it, it, it's Michael Jordan. Obviously, I know that Michael Jordan is probably the greatest player to ever play the game. I mean, that's up for debate, uh, as people talk about these days. But, like, there was also a rough side to Michael Jordan as well. Uh, a lot of people don't talk about his first couple of years when he was with the Chicago Bulls. Uh, a lot of fights, a lot of difficult times. And, look, I, I know this for a fact because I played against Jordan during that particular era. I know players, um, and without saying names, they, Jerry Stackhouse wasn't the only only player that had a hard time with Michael Jordan during that time in his career. Uh, it was towards the latter end. Michael Jordan was getting a lot of the attention as he well deserved. He's a living legend. But if you're a younger player, if you're a guy like Stack, who you want a system to be built around you, and you're a guy that's a thoroughbred that can carry a lot of the load as well, uh, that had to be frustrating. But that is Michael Jordan. Uh, that is what comes along with Michael Jordan. Because Michael Jordan was the greatest player of all time, and Michael Jordan felt like he deserved the ball at that part of his career and Doug Collins gave him the ball so uh, that's just what it is that's what comes along the territory playing with Michael Jordan Stephen A go ahead Max well I was in DC that year that he the, the the final year and you know he came back people are forgetting now I was the original host of around the horn and I was sure when last seen Jordan was so much better than like a prime Shaquille O'Neal Right? No, no one, like in Jordan's last year with the Bulls, like, is Shaq as good as Jordan? No one. And Shaq, as soon as Jordan retires, like, boy, no one can mess with Shaq. Olajuwon may have shown a little differently, but that was the perception anyway. So I was sure when Jordan came back, I was arguing he's still going to be amazing, da da da. And he played like a real kind of, um, uh, more of like a point guard y kind of player, as I recall, that first partial season back. But by the last season, he was really a kind of ISO scorer, which he was still pretty good at. He averaged 20 points on the nose that year. But I was in D.C. I went to a lot of those home games. I was in that locker room. It was not a happy-go-lucky place. It was not a place that you mm -hmm. feel like when you're in a locker room, you're like, boy, this team is rolling. Jordan had a kind of – he dampened the, the kind of enthusiasm for playing the locker room. You could feel it. And by the way – I'm one of those people who says Jordan's the best player of all time, obviously, right? Like, obviously. But that year, I thought he had a detrimental effect on the team. And by the way, in D.C., that crowd was dead the whole year. You could hear a pin drop for the home games. And Stackhouse is probably right to complain. He was an athletic marvel at the time, but it was very much Jordan's team. And that team missed the playoffs, you know? And it was because they kept feeding the ball to a guy who could score still almost on a, like a quasi all-star level, but obviously not the best player on a, on a playoff powerhouse type team. And Stackhouse must have felt like his development was uh, hindered as a result. Maybe not as much as Kwame Brown eventually, but, you know, certainly he could feel that way. Let me give you all a couple of inside nuggets here. Number one, uh, Jerry Stackhouse. Um, one of the best people you could ever meet, one of the realest brothers you could ever meet, a really good guy, really decent person, is absolutely right with what he's saying. My retort to that would be, so what? I mean, who does it? I mean, who cares? Because at the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to. Here's why I say that in the fashion that I just stated it. Um, number one, when Jerry Stackhouse was in Washington and Michael Jordan arrived, Michael Jordan didn't arrive as a player. Michael Jordan arrived with the intent to ultimately be the owner for the Washington franchise. People forget that. It went awry. Obviously, the deal that he thought he had in place with Abe Poland fell apart. And as a result, he ended up departing out of town. Nobody can speak to that more eloquently than Mike Wilbon. Mike Wilbon knows the ins and outs of that situation. He was a columnist for the Washington Post at the time. He's incredibly close to Michael Jordan. They speak often. He knew everything that was going on there. 
He can tell you about that stuff chapter and verse, how Jordan skated out of town because of a meeting he had with Abe Poland. He thought he walked in there thinking that he was going to be able to make demands, and Abe Poland's like, you must have forgot. Abe Poland's loyalty and love was for some dude named Wes Unsell, who had won a championship for the Washington Bullets in the late 70s. That's how far back A. Poland went. His loyalty, he had none with Michael Jordan, and he was annoyed by David Falk. That's number one. Number two, if you recall, this same Jerry Stackhouse started off his career in Philadelphia with the 76ers. What happened to him after his rookie year? His second year, some dude by the name of Allen Iverson arrived on the scene. Everybody knew that the answer was that dude, except for Jerry Stackhouse. Jerry Stackhouse wasn't trying to concede a damn thing. I know I covered the team. That was my first year as a beat writer covering the Philadelphia 76ers. He wasn't trying to have it. Allen Iverson came in there. He was averaging 19 shots a game. Jerry Stackhouse had 16 shots a game. Jerry Stackhouse wasn't happy about that. He didn't want to concede anything. He thought he was still that stud. In his second year in the league, he wasn't trying to concede anything to Allen Iverson. Pat Croce, Larry Brown in the franchise obviously knew better. And so ultimately, Jerry Stackhouse was shipped out of town to the Detroit Pistons before he ultimately ended up landing with the Washington, with the Washington franchise. The bottom line is, is that Jerry Stackhouse has always been a strong-minded, strong-willed dude. He was an All-American coming out of North Carolina. He, was, he wasn't Jordan, but he was incredibly athletic, finished at the rim, had an aerial assault of his own, came with his expectations as the number three overall pick in the NBA draft in 1995. All of these things came with Jerry Stackhouse, so he had his own cachet in his mind, had his own beliefs, whether it was Allen Iverson earlier in his career or, Allen I or, or Michael Jordan later in his career. The problem is Jerry Stackhouse didn't realize, at the time anyway, the answer was that dude. And when it came to Jordan, even though he was no longer the dude in Chicago, you weren't on the court with just some basketball teammate. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.